So thank you for joining us tonight. It's good to be with all of you here. Christ is risen. We are an Easter people, and Alleluia is our song. If you're a daily Mass goer or you happen to read the daily readings, you know that today we read the conclusion of John's Easter resurrection narrative, that part of the gospel left out on Easter Sunday, where Mary Magdalene alone remains at the tomb of Jesus. And she's rewarded for her steadfast love, her faithfulness, and her courage that's been characteristic of her relationship with Jesus throughout his ministry. She's rewarded. She's given the first sight of the risen Christ and commissioned to go and tell the others the good news. But Mary is not just the first witness of the risen Christ. She was also an eyewitness a few days earlier of a lynching. And she had the bravery to be there for all of that. There at the cross, there at the tomb early Easter Sunday, and there when Peter and the other disciple had fled. I can't help but think and pray with that Mary Magdalene today. We all have seen too many lynchings of our black sisters and brothers, our black siblings. And I pray that this Easter, Easter season, we have the courage to go to those painful places, those dark places in ourselves, in our church, in our history, and to weep. And more than weep, to discover signs of new life, of new possibility, and more important, when we do find those signs, when we do find those possibilities for new life, for transformation, that we go and we do something about it. We go and we tell the others. And so I join you to sing our Easter song of hope and joy with me tonight as we begin, not because Christ is risen once and for all as a matter of history, but because Christ is rising today and tomorrow because you're here because of you because of what you will see and hear and what you will go and tell the others
Thank you, Russ. As always, <laughs> your, your music ministry is so inspiring. Thank you so much. This evening, I have the joy of introducing Olga Marina Segura, opinion editor for the National Catholic Reporter, a freelance writer, and the author of The Birth of a Movement, Black Lives Matter and the Catholic Church, published by Orbis Press. I did put a link into the chat if you wanted to get the book. The work on which tonight, her presentation tonight is based. Um, her sharp insights will open your mind to new realities. It has been a popular book for the well-informed readers of Future Church. Many of you here tonight have received the book as Future Church's way of saying thank you for your donation. We thank you for your support, but more than that, we are humbled by your commitment and willingness to learn hard truths and to grow as Catholics who willingly carry out the radically inclusive, just, and loving mission of the gospel. Before Olga came to National Catholic Reporter, she was an associate editor at America Media, where she wrote and solicited articles on race and culture. She is a co-founder and former co-host of, of the podcast Jesuitical. Her writing has appeared in The Guardian, Latino Rebels, Shandanland, it's a new one for me, Sojourners, Refinery29, and The Revealer. Prior to working at American Media, Olga was an intern at the permanent mission of the Dominican Republic to the United Nations. She graduated from Fordham University with a Bachelor's of Art in English and a Bachelor's of Art in Italian and Literature. She speaks Italian and Spanish fluently and was born in Santo Domingo of the Dominican Republic. Olga writes, that when signing the contract for her book, the book she's talking about tonight in 2019, her intention at the time was to provide Catholics with a history of the Black Lives Matter movement, including both its successes and its criticisms. She knew people had misconceptions of the movement, including the belief that all the founders were irreligious or had no understanding of faith. Olga corrects the record. Tonight, she will shed light on the church's involvement with slavery and the practice of white supremacy and how that has continually, continuously produced a lackluster response from our mostly white bishops to, an interconnected, to interconnected racist systems that enslave, punish, and hold down people of color to this day. In relating the story of the Black Lives Matter movement through a Christian and Catholic lens, we will gain insights and a deeper understanding of the movement and why it can help the church and the country move closer to racial equality. Dear friends, I give you Olga Marina Segura. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Deb, for that, uh, Deborah, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, Russ, for that wonderful um, music at the start. Um, and I loved hearing where everyone is calling in um, from tonight all over the world. I'm calling in from the Bronx. So I'm glad to be in community with you all tonight. So I began reporting on the Black Lives Matter movement in 2014. And this was the start of my professional career, just a few years into my time at American Media. And I'm sorry, my neighbors have been doing construction all day. So you're gonna be hearing a lot of music and construction noise. So apologies in advance for that. Um, so I started reporting on this movement a few years into my time at American Media. And this was a moment in my career when it really felt like most of Catholic media and religious media more broadly only cared about covering the Catholic faith through a very, very white lens. And I was looking for stories that reflected the Bronx black immigrant world that I knew. In 2013, following the acquittal of George Zimmerman in the killing of Trayvon Martin, Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tometi created the Black Lives Matter movement. And these are three Black women, two of whom identify as queer, 
who have each been organizing for more than 10 years around issues like immigration rights, housing rights, reproductive justice, and police violence. At the, time that, at the time of the movement's birth, it was mostly an online campaign on Twitter and Facebook. And the founders wanted to help empower organizers, especially younger ones who had never organized before, by providing them with the resources on how to get involved in the fight for racial justice. In the summer of 2014, the founders, along with more than 400 organizers from all across the United States, traveled to Ferguson, Missouri, following the shooting death of Michael Brown Jr. And these organizers, a majority of whom were women and men in the LGBTQ community, really helped to support their marchers who were facing daily violence from law enforcement in Ferguson that summer. And after the, the, the protests that summer in, in, in Ferguson, many of these activists returned to their respective cities and started their own local BLM chapters using a lot of the resources and knowledge they gained that summer, many of which are not part of the larger BLM network we see in 2021. And almost eight years later, the movement has grown to include chapters all across the country, providing resources on restorative justice, conflict resolution, and on how to organize. And along with marching across American streets, many organizers, including many outside of the movement, were also using the hashtag to educate people about police brutality, abolition, immigration rights, and the Black Lives Matter movement and all of the organizers who have internalized a lot of its mission statement promote inclusion, affirms, the movement affirms and centers the experiences of Black queer and trans women and men. And it works toward a world where all Black people are liberated and free and by extension, all people are free. And so the more I reported on this movement, the more I learned about this movement, the more I really began to internalize the mission that these women were promoting. I started attending protests and interviewing activists I met back in 2014, 2015. I met black and brown organizers of all age groups who were talking about issues and topics that I had yet to really engage with at that point in my professional life. And I also started talking to other black Catholics who were trying to understand what this movement was and how it could or couldn't play a role in our faith. And the more I read about the movement and the founders' experiences, the more I began to follow and read social critics outside of the movement who embodied these, the tenets of the founders and their mission, the more I began to, again, internalize it and apply it to the very Catholic world that I was in. I started following Black thinkers like Sahida Kelly, Zoe Zadmudzi, Dwayne David Paul, William C. Anderson. And these were thinkers who, like the founders and organizers of the Black Lives Matter movement, these were thinkers who were using social media to help their founders think more deeply about things like blackness, abolition, sexuality, colorism, capitalism. They challenged me and I really started to think more deeply about white supremacy and how every single American institution has internalized it. And again, this was at a time, not just when I was in a very white Catholic space, but I was also trying to understand what my faith life was gonna be in adulthood, what my identity was. And this movement and the thinkers I began to learn from allowed me to begin to deconstruct a lot of the conditioning that I've internalized since arriving in the United States in the early 90s. So I began to think about what it means to identify as a Black immigrant with light skin. I began to think about my own privilege. I started to read and understand issues like misogyny, colorism, how these things had shaped my adopted home and the motherland I had left behind. I developed a framework for the first time in my adult life to talk about the anti-Blackness and colorism within my own Black Dominican community. And it really took me years to unlearn and begin to truly understand my own Black immigrant identity, one that was extremely privileged, but also extremely oppressed. And this movement, like our church, isn't perfect because anything created by and centered around human beings is imperfect. But it is a challenging movement that can really help push our church forward, especially at a time when our faith leaders seem to be entirely disconnected from the conversations marginalized Catholics are having. Black Lives Matter and other current social justice movements and organizations like the Sunrise Movement and the Dream Defenders are teaching Americans, especially millennials and younger, what it means to organize, what it means to talk about oppression, what it means to be in solidarity at a time of social distancing and limited in-person contact. It helped me to begin to decolonize my Christianity and most important, how to center voices who weren't getting a platform in our church and in media more broadly. And all of this conscientiousness altered my faith and my relationship to our church. These movements taught me how to be Catholic, 
how to be a Catholic writer, how to live out what Pope Francis was preaching. And it really helped me to think more deeply about my role as a writer. The journalism industry and secular media more broadly often promote this idea that writing and reporting has to be done as objectively as possible. But I was at a space, a Jesuit publication, and reporting on a movement that taught me that writing, especially if it were to be a vocation, could help me and others think about faith and justice and how the two were inextricably linked. Reporting on this movement really helped me to understand that writing was a way for me to be in community with God's people, God's creation. It was a way to help people think more deeply about the humanity of the most marginalized communities in our nation and in our world. I began to think more deeply about how Pope Francis was challenging us as Catholics. Pope Francis calls on us to, and I quote, get to know people, listen, expand the circle of ideas, being open to the ways God was moving us meant that we were, Francis preached, to find the courage to leave the confines of our own security and comfort, to become bruised, hurting, and dirty as we joyfully approach the suffering other in a spirit of solidarity. I applied the framework my reporting gave me to all of Pope Francis's words, and I fully accepted that my vocation was to be a Catholic writer. And now as a Catholic editor, once again, as a National Catholic Reporter, I'm also thinking about it, what it means to apply, to believe that this is my vocation um, as a writer, to do this work as a writer and editor. And this means that I'm actively and consistently working to center and uplift the experiences of people of color here and all around the world as best I can. And the more I learned about this movement, the more I began to internalize this mission into its work, into my own faith life, and the more I began to apply into any papal or church document I was reading, the more I began to feel comfortable for the first time calling myself both a writer and a journalist. And this is a really important distinction for me, and I think for a lot of writers of color in Catholic spaces, we often use these terms, both these terms, because when we tell the stories of our communities, stories that historically have been left out of our church, left out of Catholic media, we're often also serving as journalists who are reporting facts to white Catholic audiences for the first time. And so I applied, as I quoted from Pope Francis earlier, I applied my work, I applied the, the what I was internalizing again from this movement, and I realized that this is what it meant for me to leave the confines of my own comfort and approach the suffering other in a spirit of solidarity. For me, going to the margins meant not just doing this work, but also helping other people to, to understand what it meant to organize as Catholics. And this commitment to my newfound vocation, so to speak, was really solidified in 2018 when I interviewed Alicia Garza for the article that led to my eventual book deal. And at the time, I asked, I asked Garza about the movement's relationship to the Catholic Church, and she pointed to many of the religious leaders who were present in Ferguson in 2014 that supported many of the organizers on the ground. And she encouraged Catholic leaders to accompany the movement and welcomed any kind of dialogue from the US bishop. And that moment was a huge, huge turning point for me. The United States Conference of Catholic Bishops has remained silent collectively, while individual bishops have opined on this movement. Currently, there is no collective guidance from our leaders on how to engage with the Black Lives Matter movement or any current social justice movement outside of the church, especially those organized by younger people of color. There is no relationship whatsoever between our leadership and the Black Lives Matter movement. And until there is, we are going to continue to see a lot of the polarization around this movement in any conversation or actions that it sparks. The institutional church's unwillingness to engage with this movement is part of the church's history with systemic oppression. I learned about the church's complicity in chattel slavery thanks to the scholarship of Shannon D. Williams. Our church was instrumental to the industry's introduction to what became the United States in the 1500s. And Williams wrote last year that after chattel slavery was abolished, and I quote, most white Catholic religious orders of men and women and seminaries continued to systematically exclude African descended people, especially US born black people from admission on the basis of race well into the 20th century. Williams added that archival oral history and written record is also littered with heart wrenching examples of white Catholics subjecting black and brown Catholics to humiliating segregation and exclusion in white led parishes, schools, hospitals, convents, seminaries and neighborhoods. 
Throughout its history in various iterations, the USCCB has only released four statements on racism in the United States. Most recently, the 2018 pastoral letter, Open Wide Our Hearts, an enduring call to love. There has been no collective apology for the church's complicity in the sin of racism, no public dialogue on police brutality, white privilege, misogyny, abolition. And we have yet to see any collective public statement from American bishops on the Black Lives Matter movement or any racial justice efforts more broadly. What we have seen, however, are individual faith leaders denigrating the Black Lives Matter movement and the founders. We have seen church leaders internalize misconceptions about racial justice efforts in 2020. Last year, Washington's Bishop Daly, excuse me, denigrated the Black Lives Matter movement. A priest called activists in the movement maggot and New York's Cardinal Dolan equated the oppression of black Americans with what he perceived to be the, the oppression of the New York Police Department. The very colonialist sentiments that guided the early church and the so-called founders of this country are echoed in the inability of our church leaders to collectively engage with any movement that is not led by white men. There can be no reckoning and no path forward for our church until our leaders and all our white Catholics begin to repair the harm our church has caused and continues to cause Catholics of color. White people in our church and country don't want to relinquish or even talk about the power that white people, white Catholics hold in this country. This means talking about white privilege, how white supremacy and racial capitalism has benefited them while simultaneously exploiting and killing communities of color. We have seen it happen in the past year alone. More than 500,000 Americans have died during the pandemic that has made white men and institutions even richer. No one wants to sit with the reality that if you truly care about solidarity, if you, as a white Catholic, truly care, care about black lives, about creating a more inclusive church and nation, then you have to ask yourself, what am I willing to give up to truly center and uplift people of color? For the USCCB, allyship requires bishops collectively and publicly grappling with issues that Catholics of color are demanding they grapple with like police brutality and what it means to abolish the prison industrial complex in the United States. Faith leaders and communities play a huge role in public policy in the United States. We saw how intensely both presidential candidates campaigned for specific religious communities and leaders last year, in particular Christian Catholic voters. I would love to see our leaders this year figuring out how to protest during a pandemic and then using their organizing power, whatever that might look like, to challenge police departments across the country and raise funds for black and brown organizers, especially women who are organizing on the ground all across the country. Our institutional church has yet to publicly grapple with any of the issues Catholics have demanded they engage with. For this reason, our bishops have a lot of work to do if we are to believe that they truly care about liberation for all people. This begins by joining abolition work and helping Catholics to think more deeply about the public policies that affect the day-to-day -day lives of already vulnerable citizens. We have seen black and brown Catholics doing anti-racism work in the church since its birth. We know there were black and brown Catholics present in Ferguson in 2014, and we know that Catholics of color and many white Catholics protested in a variety of different ways all across the country following the murders of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and others killed last year. I interviewed Catholics who were present in Missouri in 2014, and I talked to Catholics this year who have marched in protest in their respective cities. And even before the birth of the Black Lives Matter movement, communities of color and other marginalized communities have been challenging the church to step outside of its whiteness. Additionally, thanks to the research of Anthea Butler, Tio Noel Pratt, Father Brian Massingale, and many black and brown Catholics. Every day we are learning new ways to be in solidarity with one another and push our church forward. In 2020 alone, we saw white Catholics engaging with the movement and many were actively and consistently raising funds for organizers and using their various platforms to urge fellow white Catholics to support people of color being disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Many hosted Zoom book clubs and webinars where they discussed many of the topics I've mentioned here tonight. Many listened and learned from women and men of color. 
All of these efforts are important and they must continue, but they are not enough. And white Catholics, both lay and clergy must not get complacent. Primarily white Catholic institutions from hospitals to academic institutions to media must create positions in their respective fields for people of color. One of the many consequences of white supremacy, not just in the United States, but all across the world, is that the people most impacted by the evils of systemic oppression are also simultaneously internalizing the very racist norms of our oppressors. This is why I share my own unlearning of Dominican anti-blackness and privilege. This is why we have people of color who voted for Trump last year. Catholic media in particular has to get better about covering our varied lived experiences and beliefs beginning by allowing us to tell our own stories. This is what it means for white Catholics in particular to do what I described earlier, the courage to have, as I described earlier, excuse me, the courage that Pope Francis preached to live the confines of our security, our comfort, and to really become bruised. Solidarity requires sacrifice and white Catholics must embrace that and internalize that. The urgency in these words is necessary and really became an inextricable part of my work last year. In December of 2019, I left my first full-time job as an associate editor at American Media to freelance and write my first book. As Deborah mentioned, I originally conceived of this book as what I like to call gentle accompaniment. I would write a Catholic anti-racism book that would commend Catholics who have demonstrated their commitment to fighting for racial equity and challenge, also very gently, Catholics who have remained silent on Black Lives Matter and issues like police violence. To put it frankly, I was extremely afraid to upset white people and burn bridges in an already small religious media world, but then 2020 happened. The pandemic has killed more than 500,000 Americans and in New York, my hometown, more than 30,000 people have lost their lives. Thousands have lost health insurance, jobs, savings, their homes. Along with being disproportionately affected by this pandemic, communities of color continue to face violence at the, ha at the hands of armed police officers. In 2020 alone, more than 800 people died at the hands of American law enforcement. By the summer, anti-police protests erupted all across the United States. And as I was processing these tragedies and attempting to write my first book, my father got COVID. My partner's father got COVID. Friends lost relatives, jobs. And amid all that, cops were still shooting Black Americans. Violence against transgender women and men was still rising. And so birth of a movement and all of my work became more urgent. I no longer wanted to hold, so to speak, the hands of white Catholics and white Christians I wanted to challenge white people inside and outside of the church to internalize that they had power they had to shift to other communities. I wanted white Catholics to confront their privilege and think about how they have been complicit in systemic oppression. And I wanted our faith leaders to publicly begin to grapple with the pro-life issues that matter to black indigenous POC communities. This year, Along with the pandemic and anti-racism uprising we are seeing in the United States and all around the world, we have also seen political leaders on the left and right weaponize Christianity. And within the Catholic Church, we continue to see the disconnect between the church's leadership and the suffering of marginalized communities. And the book can no longer be gentle. It became as urgent as I have felt this year, as tired, as afraid, as devastated, I no longer care about consoling white feelings. I care about struggling toward a world where black people and all indigenous Asian people of color are free. And as such, I am committed as an editor and writer to center and uplift not, the, not just the joys of my community, but the trauma and suffering of it as well. To conclude, I would like to share something that I've only recently started to discuss publicly, but which further demonstrates the urgency of my work and the work of all Catholic women and men of color. 2020, as I mentioned earlier, was also my first year as a full-time, as I mentioned earlier, maybe Deborah mentioned it um, in the introduction, I can't recall, but 2020 was my first year as a full-time freelance writer. So um, 
as I was researching and working on my book, I was also freelancing and pitching articles um, to various different publications. And my first freelance piece was published in February or, Mar or March of last year. And every month after my first uh, freelance piece was published last year, I received a piece of hate mail every single month. White men were the authors of each of these messages, a fact easily confirmed since most provided full names, home cities, and even profile pictures. They were angry because I wrote about whiteness in the UFO community. Some were angry because I profiled a black gay priest, others because I criticized bishops. All called me uninformed about my faith, politics, and race. I read every email and dismissed most of the messages as harmless. The more violent ones, I dissected word for word. I wanted to memorize each line, every tone, every description of violence, believing this was the way to steal myself against such rhetoric in the future. I was working on my first book at, during in the middle of all of this and barely eating or stand or barely eating or standing up from a very poorly self-constructed desk made up of a piano bench and this really unsupportive yellow poof pillow. And I wrote using this self-made desk every day by my living room window. And for six weeks from June to July, I woke up every day at 5 a.m. and wrote nonstop for five or six hours. I ignored my partner, barely speaking to him for longer than 20 minutes at a time. My anxiety was getting worse and worse as I attempted to write and process everything that was happening around me. I zealously poured over every COVID-19 death, every murder at the hands of armed white racists, every change in the Trump administration, every racist comment by a member of our church. By the end of the summer, I rarely left my home and I worried whenever my partner left our apartment. Slowly I learned that anxiety was also physical. For months at a time, I couldn't walk without back, shoulder, or chest pain. And I rarely ate without a subsequent wave of nausea. Anxiety was a part of my vocation, my ministry, I told myself. So I continued to find new ways to fuel it. Each week I memorized each violent email. I will always remember the violence white Catholic men felt entitled to share with me including violence against myself, my family, and the individuals who trust me with their stories. This is not an anomaly. This is America. This is the Catholic Church. Catholic women of color have shared similar stories with me in private, online and in our daily lives, from our faith leaders who denigrate social justice movements to the insurrectionists who stormed the US Capitol on January 6th, to the 21-year-old who shot eight women in Atlanta last month, White violence permeates every single part of our lived experiences. Confronted by a religious media landscape seemingly unwilling to cover this insidious aspect of white supremacy, we find solace in the liberatory spaces we have carved out for one another and ourselves over Twitter messages, emails, texts, video chats, and calls. These spaces, free of white men or women, are exclusively ours, liberated from our churches like Catholicism. In these spaces, we've analyzed every violent event that has happened this year. Unsurprised at the violence and habitual, excuse me, in these spaces, we've analyzed every single violent event that has happened this year. This was not America, many proclaimed every single time some tragedy happened because our country represented more than white violence, white rage. Yet this was exactly what democracy has always been. For better or worse, American democracy was born out of violence and continues to be sustained by systems that exploit, torture, and incarcerate marginalized citizens. From prisons to, to detention centers, to Silicon Valley, to our healthcare system, to our church. The United States has always encouraged white rage and violence. European colonizers, angered by the treatment they received in their homelands, arrived on Turtle Island and violently stormed and pillaged lands that were not theirs. Colonizers raped and murdered and profited from this violence, selling enslaved African women, men, and children. The creation of new technology at the turn of the 20th century meant more reformed, sanitized systemic violence against citizens of color, segregation, voting restrictions, redlining, prisons, detention centers. The United States of America, as of 2021, has the highest number of incarcerated people. 
and our inequitable, excuse me, healthcare system has caused the deaths of more than 500,000 Americans. Black, Black and Latinx citizens continue to be disproportionately affected by the pandemic, with women of color making up the majority of unemployment rates. Black mothers continue to receive inadequate medical care from primary, primary care physicians denying their pain to higher maternal mo mortality rates. Indigenous teens face the highest rates of suicide rates and domestic abuse. Asian women are most likely to remain unemployed longer than six months. And the Asian community continues to be harassed and assaulted by racists all across the country. And US Black and Latinx transgender women are three times more likely to be killed. Americans of color also face higher rates of anxiety, depression, and are more likely to suffer a heart attack or stroke. I'm sharing these statistics and my own story and those of other women of color today because white people in our church need to understand that along with the various tragedies threatening our livelihood, we are also suffering anxiety, depression. We are spiritually devastated. We are spiritually suffering. And this is violence. Every single day enacted upon our communities, our lives. And to be a pro-life church means that we must be a church that fights to free communities like mine from any kind of suffering. Our church will never be a Christ-centered, authentically and holistically pro-life church until all people are liberated. Thank you all so much for listening to my talk uh, just now, and I hope this this resonates with you all tonight. And I'm exact, and I'm really excited to to talk some more with you all. Thank you for listening. Oh, thank you, Olga. Thank you. Thank you, of course. Thank you for inviting me into the space to share my experience. Well, we're going to do a question and answers. Um, and those of you who have been with us before, uh, what, what we ask you to do is to raise your hand or to unmute yourself and then you come to the top of the list and then I'll call on you. But before we do that, I just would like to just take a moment of silence and just to let Olga's words, your experience, the pain, I feel it through the, as you speak. Um, let's just hold Olga and the black, our black brothers and sisters for a moment. We're blessed and we're honored by your witness, Olga. So, um, so as you are beginning to think of what questions you would like to ask Olga, um, I would like to start with one that uh, in uh, reading your book, a wonderful book, I hope you all can uh, get a copy and read it. It is, uh, it's marvelous. Um, one of the things that you talk about in your book is this issue with the bishops and the issue of abortion, how it's become the preeminent issue, the, the issue of priority. And um, you talk, you, you quote, uh, uh, Rebecca is her name, and she talk about how she is sort of a traditional in her sort of spiritual beliefs, and yet she understands that the bishops aren't aren't looking at the complex way that issues uh, come to us. So she called it intersectionality. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's how, you know, isms sort of overlap each other in, in the world. And you, so you report on her, her dissatisfaction with the bishops, but, I, but Brian Massengill, Father Brian Massengill goes a little bit further. And he says that this whole issue of abortion is actually just a thin cover for racism. It is actually racism in action. It is taking one issue that appeals to white Catholics 
doesn't have that much real consequence in their life. And it becomes wedded to all these other uh, sins, uh, crimes. <laughs> uh, and I just wondered about your thoughts on that. Uh, when you talk about the US bishops and their lackluster response and the, the deficiencies of the 2018 statement and their deficiencies in general as a whole conference uh, in leading Catholics on this issue. I wondered what you felt about this constant push to talk about abortion. Yeah, um, first of all, thank you, Deborah, for reading the book and for your insight into um, some of the parts of the book that really spoke to you. And my thoughts on the bishops and the abortion um, issue, I think that the bishops, like most institutions that are led by a group of older celibate, mostly white men, I think a lot of institutions become really focused on sexuality and not even sexuality from a completely holistic and authentic perspective. They become obsessed with sexuality and the abortion question because there's this need to control women and there's this need to be in control of how we should define what it means to be pro-life, how we should define what issues, what issues the church should care about. And I, and I agree with Massingale. I think that often a lot of leaders hide behind the abortion issue, not because it's not an important issue, not because we shouldn't prioritize unborn life, but because it's easier for them to defend the unborn. It's easier for them to have a victim that they can feel sorry for, but it's a lot harder for them to engage with movements that they see, not just as ir irreligious, but also as movements and issues that they see as not affecting their daily life. And that's what the reality of it is. It's very, very hard for bishops, white male bishops, of who, most of whom are also over a certain age, it's very difficult for them to step outside of their whiteness and to step outside of how they define what it means to be a church. And for this reason, they become so concerned with the abortion question and they become so concerned with that being the most important issue in our church and in our country today. But the reality is the most important thing for a pro-life church is to prevent Americans to prevent human beings from losing their lives. People are dying every single day. People are dying because our healthcare system is unequal. People are dying because law enforcement is so militarized. People are dying because governors, conservative governors are trying to restrict access to all of the things we need. These are the things that matter. And these are the things that should matter to the bishops. But again, our church is really into incrementalism and our church is really into hiding behind issues that may or may not require them to be proactive now. And trying to become an ally in racial justice requires bishops to do work right now, not six months from now, not a year from now, but right now. And I think that's why they're so unwilling to really engage with this because they don't wanna confront their own, their own privilege, but most important, they don't wanna confront their own power. And this is what the issue is when they don't talk about racism is because they don't want to have to admit to the faithful, hey, we have been complicit as white men with power in the United States. We have been complicit. And so this is why I think so many, and not just bishops, but so many faith leaders and lay Catholics too, because I get this from lay Catholics too, who think, well, you know, you're so concerned with racial justice or you're so concerned with abolition with the prison industrial complex and all of these things, but why aren't you concerned with abortion and all these other things that, that are happening in our world? And it's not that I'm not concerned with it, it's just we should be concerned with where the tragedy is happening, with where we're losing these lives. And I think until our leaders are ready, I said during my talk, solidarity requires sacrifice, right? And real, real sacrifice. Russ said beautifully that we're an Easter people and we believe in the resurrection and we believe in the hope that our faith professes and solidarity is born out of the resurrection. Christ shows us what it means to fight for people and until the bishops do that, they're gonna keep hiding behind issues that they think are more significant instead of placing their bodies on the line. And so those are my thoughts about that. I hope I kind of, I, I tend to ramble a little and get really, really passionate, but I hope I answered it, Deborah. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. So we have a question from R.C. Handy is how the, the name is showing up. Good evening. Thank you so very much. Two things. 
I was wondering just how many people, often when there is a situation, even with the George Floyd situation, Mm -hmm. many white Americans said, I had no idea. I had no idea that Mm -hmm. this was going on, that this is the case. And I'm just wondering how many people on this line had no idea or continue to be very sheltered and not know exactly what's going on. And then secondly, I was in a group with a parish, well, bigger than a parish, so maybe like a pastoral region. And we were doing a round robin and we were talking about um, what were some of the good things to celebrate in your parish at that particular Mm -hmm. time. And three of the parishes all celebrated the number of uh, increased attendance by Mm -hmm. um, people of Latin, Latina, Um, population and how they were really making a a difference in the parish and really showing up as a family. And then the very next agenda item was representation for that particular segment. And a person said, well, wait a minute, they get representation too? Mm -hmm. And it was just so stark and so immediate. In one vein, all of the growth that we were celebrating was due to that population. But in the next vein, we still don't want to deem you equal or give you a seat at the table. And I, mm-hmm. this was two, three months ago. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much, um, RC, for sharing that um, on both those points. And you described one of the biggest, with your first point, you described one of the biggest frustrations for me um, not not this event particularly, but I've done a lot of events where I, during the Q&A section, I have a lot of white Catholics who tell me, oh, wow, we didn't know. We didn't know, or we didn't know you guys were feeling this way. We didn't know that you guys were spiritually devastated or spiritually suffering. And that's frustrating because we know that we're suffering. <laughs> we see our suffering every single day. We talk about it in our own communities. Um, and it's always, always really devastating to hear that and to know that our pain is not um, centered in the way that it should be. But this is, again, why I'm always pushing the faith leader angle. This is why I'm saying that the bishops need to care about these things, because until our leaders start talking about it and until our leaders start demanding that, especially conservative white Catholics with money who will listen to these bishops, so who will not listen to me, until these bishops start doing that work, we're going to keep having people to continue to be surprised because yes, everything that happened to George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, every single person that was killed last year was awful. But we know that this is not new to America. America has always been violent and our church needs to start naming that, our leaders need to start naming that, our our, white Catholics need to start naming that. And I think that people really struggle with that. White Catholics really struggle with that because again, they don't want to admit that they have been complacent. They don't want to talk about their privilege, but they need to, right? Again, solidarity requires for white Catholics to do this work. It shouldn't just be on us to keep reminding our community, you know? Exactly. And, and, and to that point, there's very little that happens in the world that I'm not aware of that mm-hmm. pertains to my community or does not pertain to my community. I am just not privileged enough to live in a vacuum right. and only be concerned with matters that directly affect me. And mm-hmm. I, it just blows my brain to think mm-hmm. that there is that opportunity for others. And it's, it, it's so disappointing, but at the same time, conversations like this are very heartening and I'm very excited to see the number of participants on this call and I appreciate the willingness to find a safe space to share this type of information so thank you so very much of course of course and thank you for sharing your your insights as well um, and your own frustrations Arcee amen thank you let's go to Rosa Uh, you have your hand up yes And thank you very much, Olga, for everything that you are saying. I share your frustration and I I do have one question, but in sharing that frustration, um, I'm most frustrated by the sin of omission of the USCCB. And the president, unfortunately, is um, the Archbishop here in Los Angeles, who is Mm -hmm. a member of Opus Dei Mm -hmm. and who is a person of color. Mm 
-hmm. And I am frustrated because for the past two campaigns that Trump was spouting what he had to say, um, either there was no word or there was support from the pulpit of extraordinary things. And they all supported him knowing damn well what he was going to do to immigrants mm -hmm. and to people of color. And then once he was elected and children were put in, in cages and all, the bishops started pounding their chests. Mm -hmm. um, they used abortion as we all see as the way to do this. And personally speaking for myself, I do believe in the sacredness of life from conception but that is not the burden to be put on the shoulders of the woman alone. A man who rapes a woman has no, has no respect for life from conception. People mm -hmm. who know that they will refuse to help raise a child have no respect for life from conception. And I think it's mm -hmm. time that the men in our church took mm -hmm. their burden on their shoulders and their responsibility on their shoulders and actually walk their talk. Um, I want to know if you think the institution of the church is redeemable. If there's something that can be done, I mean, sometimes I think if they started teaching anti-racism training in the seminaries, if they made it um, mandatory that anyone who becomes a pastor must have anti-racism training. I mean, that's just the start. Do you mm -hmm. think it is possible or is the institution going to have to crumble and we're going to have to build again or simply uh, um, embrace our spirituality? Hmm. First of all, I'll, I want to answer your question, but thank you so much for sharing um, your frustrations, especially with, with Jose Gomez. He has been someone who has been especially frustrating in the past year because I also haven't forgotten when he and Cardinal Dolan got on a phone call with Trump and praised him in the middle of a pandemic in the middle of all the awful things that were happening and he has been particularly disappointing in in recent years um but to answer your question rosa at my most cynical and my lowest point faith when my faith is at its lowest point i think this church cannot be saved i don't believe in the redemption of this church i don't believe that our leaders can be better i don't believe in the redemption of the catholic church for lack of a better word and then my my partner, um, Enoch, who I, I love very much and who's also a much, I like to say he's a better Christian than I am. He, he often reminds me, if we believe in the power of the cross, if we believe in, in Christ and we believe in the tenets of our faith, then we believe that through God, anyone can be redeemed, right? And so at my most positive, on my most positive days, I do believe that the church, the institutional church could be redeemed. But again, it requires such a radical, radical shift in how our leaders even define what it means to be an institutional church, because all of the wonderful things you just mentioned, Rosa, are very immediate steps that can be taken by our leaders. You can demand that anyone entering into seminary take anti-racism training. You can demand that every year our bishops do this work and every year our bishops organize. And I think that it is possible, but I don't know if we will see it in the next 10 or 15 years. And that's really, really disappointing because the future of our church is at stake. I think ultimately we will be okay because no matter what, we have God with us. We have our community, we have our faith, we have what we believe and we have our relationship, our personal relationships with Christ. However, I don't think that we will see it in, in the next 10 or 15 years, but I want to. I think that for the future of the church, we have to do this work. We have to, if we really, really want to be a universal Catholic community that is truly, truly committed to the life and dignity of every single person, then we have to do this work. But I don't know how it's going to start. I don't know who's going to start it. Um, but I hope that someone does. I hope that tomorrow Jose Gomez wakes up and says, you know what? I'm going to march. I'm going to march in the streets and I'm going to stop talking about abortion for the next five years. And I'm only going to talk about racial justice and how to build a better church. Um, but I do think it's, I think it's redeemable, but I think it's going to require a huge, huge sacrifice on the part of our white, white leaders. And I don't know if they're ready to do that. And that's, that's really, really scary for the future of our church. But I think if they want to, if they want to be redeemed and they want to do the work, then it's possible. But again, like you mentioned, 
it shouldn't be on the abortion question. It shouldn't be on the sh on our shoulders to do this work. It should be on our white leaders. It should be on all, all of our bishops, but especially um, the USCCB and especially white Catholics. So I hope I hope that that sort of answered um, your question. Okay, and and I recommend a book to you too. It's mm -hmm. called Colonizing Christianity: Becoming Badass Believers, by Miguel oh. de la Torre. And okay. I hear the tone of voice that I hear in him, I'm hearing in you, which is basically enough is enough. I am not holding your hand anymore. I am not drying your tears anymore. This is what it is. And you have to look at it. You have to listen and you have to see what, what has happened. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for that book recommendation. I'm always looking to read more about what it means to decolonize my faith and what it means to even use that language. So thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you, Olga. Wonderful exchange. Uh, yes, please don't hold our hands anymore. We're going to stand up. Uh, so Kay Ferlani, you have a question. Um, yeah, I, um, uh, I'm going to proceed it with before when the question about about white people not knowing, I would have to say for myself, I knew and had a, a good sense of the, the racism and the level of racism and the violence that was happening against people of color because of some experiences that I had. But I would have to say for myself, particularly when George Floyd was killed, hmm. it catapulted me into another space around what was happening mm -hmm. that has really made me become much bolder about the need to speak out and to say things, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, um, and I, I, I'm, ha I'm happy that that has happened for me. And I just hope that I continue to have whatever mm -hmm. coverage it is so that I can be a true ally with, mm -hmm. with people who are, um, who are working for, um, for justice for everybody. Ultimately, mm -hmm. that's what it's about. And mm -hmm. you know, when I think about the abortion thing that you you raised, my my uh, big issue has been hunger, and it's very related to racism too, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. always has stymied me how people in the church have not, and the bishops have not addressed, say, even an issue like hunger, which threatens people's lives and children's lives. You know, in lieu of the focus being on on abortion, you know, so I I think that that's a real de deficiency, you know. Mm -hmm. But the thought mm -hmm. that the que that I'd like to hear you say something a little bit more about that I've been thinking quite a bit about is the not only white superiority but superiority. You know, I think just imbues our culture and our church mm -hmm. with all kinds of superiority, white superiority, clerical superiority, male superiority, ethnic superiority. Mm -hmm. And that that, it, you know, that it just seems to me that that is so at the heart of the conversional experience that we're called to, you know? Um, and I just wondered if you could say a, a little bit more about that, um, you know, um, the need to dismantle systems that are built on superiority. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much um, for, for sharing about your own sort of personal uh, journey in the past year. Um, I always think it's important for people to, to, share, um, to share stories like what you just shared, Kay, because I like to remind people, everyone is at a different part of this journey and it's okay if, the ch if our change of hearts happen at different moments. That's part of the reason why I like to share my own personal faith journey reporting on this movement because I didn't think this way five years ago. I was someone mm -hmm. who had very much internalized that superiority complex that you had just described, right? I was grew up in the United States for most of my life and I grew up very individualistically and I grew up to think in order to succeed, you have to step over someone and you have to be the best mm -hmm. and you have to intentionally or not, push people on your way to the top. And that is very much born out of the same white supremacist violence that gave birth to this country. We introduced human enslavement into this country and every awful system that we still have presently in the United States was born out of that. And even how we culturally define what it means to be an American people was born out of that. And capitalism has created a culture where mm -hmm. people don't know how to step outside of that superiority 
um, for lack of a better word, that sort of superiority complex that many, many people can have. And that's why it's so difficult for people to do that. I've even noticed in my own life in the past year, right, the pandemic has forced us to shift how we think about what it means to be in community with one another. And I have had many moments where I have had to really deconstruct certain instincts that I know capitalism has instilled in me, certain instincts, especially as a writer, I can get <coughs> very, very jealous and very envious. And I think to myself, oh, I can't help this other person out because if I help them out, then I will somehow be detracting from my own writing career. And that's not true, right? Like we're supposed to be in community. We're supposed to be helping one another. But I think that is just one of the evils of capitalism. I think that it has created a culture where we are more inclined to think about how to become better, how to become richer, how to become stronger, how to become anything in, over other people. And I think that, again, it's going to require a huge, huge radical shift to break us away from that, not just in the country, but the church as well, because the church, mm -hmm. the American church has been formed by all of these things that we have discussed. Mm -hmm. And it's, that is also a part of the revolution. And that is also a part of the liberatory work that we're supposed to do, right? It's not just organizing in the streets. It's not just fundraising. It's not just learning about anti-racism, but it's also changing our hearts internally and challenging the systems that, that we are forced to work in, the systems that we're forced to be educated in. And I think that we, I'm excited to see in the past year that there are people who are doing this work. We see a lot of grassroots organizers who are helping, especially young thinkers, to not internalize this very individualistic, superior way of thinking. Um, but I think it's going to require a huge, huge shift for American culture to break free from that, because unfortunately, that's what capitalism has done, right? It's created it's created a culture where we try to commodify anything just for our own betterment, right? Um, and so I think that I'm hopeful that we will see changes. But I think, again, it's going to require a huge, huge social shift to move away from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Thank you Thank again. You. Thanks, Kay. Let's move on to Marie. You have a question? Marie and Sarah? Yes, actually, yes, hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to comment. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, Olga and Deborah, for your questions. I have to say I'm not as kind as I think you were in responding to the issue of what drives the bishop's positions. I think it's just rank hypocrisy and common and just callousness to allow for people to ignore these issues to focus on not pro-life, it's pro-birth. There's no plan for the living, it's only for the unborn. And we know that many of these options, birthing option centers that have been set up to, to attract women who are pregnant, most cases they're advising the workers that once the baby's born, don't encourage too much uh, uh, dependency by that mom, cut them loose because then after all, it's their problem problem. So other than, I guess, writing to the bishops, wondering if maybe a tactic similar to the one that the Roman Catholic women priest movement adopted with little calling cards that can be put in, in the basket, the collection basket, because let's face it, that's really where it hurts the most. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And not another penny until these issues are looked at. We're more than 50, we women are more than 50% of the Catholic Church, uh, the, the people in the PUs, and we cannot continue to be ignored. And the other point is, no matter how white you are, there's no more excuse for not seeing what the reality is. And I think those are all super important issues that have to be discussed. Let's not work on denying people communion, you know, because you don't agree with their positions or advising people not to take a vaccine because it was based on stem cell research, horrors. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. You just described a wonderful example of organizing that people can do, right? The collection plates, that is one way where that people can organize. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that, Marie. Thank you. So let's move to Matt. You have a question? Yes, thank you. Um, and I feel like it fits right in this train. Um, yeah, we can pray for changes in hearts and minds, but we want to create change. We have to make it happen. What are some of the stories that you know of, or what are some ideas you have of how we organize in our churches, how we put pressure on our priests and leaders um, so that 
we can actually change things. I know we have a hierarchy, but uh, I do believe that people power moves things. Um, so I'm just love to hear any stories or ideas you have. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, some of the, the stories that I've been most inspired by in, in, in sort of in the reporting I've done throughout the years, but mostly in, in the past year, I've seen a lot of people who have started groups that started off as book clubs with people reading a lot of the recommended, recommended anti-racism texts that we've seen in the past year. But I've seen a few who have adapted these clubs to always have a call to action. So whether it's every week, bi-weekly or monthly, people meet, discuss a topic, book, article, podcast, whatever it might be, and then they give each other a call to action and then they follow up every time they meet. So they've created, and, and again, it's very, very small, very grassroots. And a lot of these are very, very intimate spaces. However, it's a way to hold each other accountable. And it's a way to do it in a very small intimate space that doesn't feel super overwhelming because we're still in the middle of a pandemic. So people are, are very scared to, to go out and organize. But that is one of the things that I have found that, is, that has been super, super helpful and super important to do to just come up with groups where you come up with an action plan, where you come up with concrete goals that you want to push your parish or the bishops forward. And I think one thing that I like to tell people is it's okay if that looks very different if you start off with that in six months from now, you realize it doesn't work. I think that I get this question a lot, Matt, so thank you for raising it. And one thing that I tell people, aside from sharing the stories that I have, you know, I have people who have started mutual aid funds with their small uh, Catholic groups. I have, I've seen people who have invited organizers who are doing work down in Atlanta into their weekly Bible studies. I've seen things like that. We're really just learning from organizers. I think one of the number one things that it's important to do is to center organizers who are doing this work. And again, follow in their leadership. One of the number one organizers who I mentioned in the book and who has helped me just in my own sort of biases and to step outside of my own privilege is Clarissa Brooks. She's an, ab <clears throat> excuse me, she's Clarissa Brooks. She's an abolitionist based in Atlanta. And she does really, really wonderful work. Um, but the, la the last thing I'll say aside from those examples is to just get creative with it. I think that right now there's no right or wrong way to be a Catholic organizer. And I think that that means that we are in such an exciting time because we can figure out what it means to do that work. And we can do all of the wonderful things that I've mentioned, all of the bishops, faith leaders work. But I think this is a moment for why Catholics do get creative and to figure out what it means to do that work at this moment. So I hope that was kind of helpful for you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Marion, you have a question? Yes, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, there's an old spiritual, uh, a black gospel spiritual that goes, uh, when money rules the pulpit, then the devil rules the pew. Mm -hmm. And what has happened is that the Catholic Church, we know, I'm from that product of where there was the line that said colored on this side of the church, white on that side of the church. We were the last ones to come and get communion. It was in the back of the church. But what has happened uh, is that the Catholic Church was so afraid of losing the money, the tidings to keep the church going, that the entitlement took place. And so therefore, the Blacks were left behind. But what has happened is, and I'm so happy to see it, is that today, the young people of today did not realize that this had been going on and that this had been going on for a long time. And they're no longer going to accept what we had accepted. Uh, we accepted a lot of things just to belong to the Catholic Church. And I'm talking about, I'm one of those cradle Catholics, you know, uh, and uh, matter of fact, I can count back seven generations of Catholics in my family from reservations to slavery even. And so therefore, but I'm very happy to see that the people, the entitlement people are waking up and they don't like that name entitlement anymore. Mm -hmm. Though very important now, uh, I, I saw, I belong to an organization and the, they were, had a social group called Black Lives Matter and some of the bishops made them change it and it became the dignity of Black Lives. 
now, I won't go so far as to say how I felt about that and I voiced my opinion. Uh, but if we're not going to stand for something, as they say, you'll fall for anything. And they go back and always use uh, abortion. And abortion, we're supposed to look at from the, from the womb to the tomb. And so abortion, yes, it's a horrible, horrible thing. But when you cut a person's life out when they're grown, mm -hmm. is that not also a form of abortion? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, I just think that um, I'm happy to see that the younger people are stronger or standing up and fighting for, for this. Such people as yourself, Olga, thank you so much. You have really lightened up and, and educated. Uh, I pray for you. Uh, you're mm -hmm. strong and that's what it takes for us to move ahead. And that's what it's going to take to take that word entitlement out of the Catholic church. Mm. Thank you so much, Marian. That was beautifully said. We do need to take that word out of the Catholic church. Thank you so much, Marion. Joan, you have a question. I, I do. It's first of all, sweetheart, God bless you. And thank you for your boldness and for your courage. Um, thank you for being a part of a generation that might make a difference. Um, I, I, I can say that and my heart leads me to say that, um, you know, someone mentioned about the, the USCCB. Well, probably about 25 years ago, uh, Blessed Sister Thea Bowman came before the committee talking of the same thing. And here it is 25 years later, and we're still talking about it. You know, I think change doesn't happen unless people, uh, change doesn't happen unless people get sick and tired of being sick and tired. You know, I remember having a pastor come to our church as a child. He's the only pastor that would come to our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. We were a black Catholic parish. We were a, th a thriving, um, Black Catholic Parish. Um, our choir director was Grayson Warren Brown. You know, we had we had this, and people wouldn't. And I have to say, as recent as four years ago, last month, one of that same pastor who was willing to come to our parish, when he passed away, they had this massive transference. Hmm. I was one of two other people of color at that mass. And I was refused the blood of Christ. That's just recent as three years ago. Lord. This man told me no. And I say that to say that there are so many things that are maybe public, but there are a whole lot of things that go on behind closed doors. And you mm -hmm. think, you know, if everybody owns their own truth, what are they going to do with the priest who tells you, well, your parish is down the road? Mm -hmm. But what are they going to do to a priest who says, puts his hand over the chalice that says, no, nothing's going to happen to him. Mm -hmm. Nothing's going to happen. You know, so it's good to see that you are part of a force mm -hmm. that may be something that'll, because some of those old folks are kind of gone now. Mm -hmm. You know, this is something that has gone on when George Floyd was murdered in living color on public television, mm -hmm. you could not deny that, is it, that it existed. Because it didn't just touch the world as, as a world of humanity, it also touched the church. So if you weren't sure before or you had your doubts, mm -hmm. it was right there before you. A man in uniform with his hand in his pocket and his knee on somebody else's neck. Mm -hmm. But I think in any way, before there can be a communal conversion, there has to be a personal one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So until these guys who are in part of the hierarchy, until they realize their own truth, if you are racist bastard, then you'd be a racist bastard, but at least own it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if you want to be the one to save souls for Christ that you have entrusted us to be, then you wear that coat of armor, sir. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be a shepherd, mm -hmm. tell me why I should be one of your sheep. Mm. You know, so we give them the power that they deserve. They ain't got. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I ain't kissing mm -hmm. nobody's ring. 
Mm. <laughs> that ain't in the Bible. <laughs> I don't know if they wash their hands. <laughs> Uh, Joan, somehow you got muted. Okay. Somehow we have now gotten a Cardinal Wilton Gregory. Mm. So we've got someone in the front view. Mm -hmm. And I just happen to be privileged to have known him before he was even a, 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 a bishop. But we got somebody in the driver's seat in D.C. Mm hmm so again, thank you for your courage and your strength and that we continue. But I say for your generation to come, hold on to the hope that's there because you might be the one. We were in a, a pro-cathedral in our diocese, a gospel choir. And the pastor had to tell us the congregation didn't want us. Hmm. So I'm part of a generation who was told we didn't want you. Mm -hmm. But that plate will come around that basket will come around. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to value life, we value life for the purpose of what God had given us. Someone just sent me something yesterday that has Jesus on the cross, nailed and crowned, looking like me. And the caption was, I can't breathe. So baby girl, let you be a part of the new breath for this new Easter that we may experience. Mm. Thank you so much, Joan. First of all, thank you for, for speaking, um, sharing your experience with me today and for everything you just said. And I'm so sorry that that happened to you, that that was denied to you because you're absolutely right. Those are the parts of, that is how insidiously racism and white supremacy operate in our church. And this is why I'm so adamant and critical of Catholic media in particular, because these are the stories that need to be told. Yes, we need to talk about Trump and all these politicians being really, really racist and all these people with power. But we also need to talk about all of the daily experiences of discrimination and racism that we face in our physical institutional churches. And thank you so much for, for everything you said about uh, me holding on to hope because it is hard. It's very hard to do this work and it's very hard to try to do this work, try to be faithful, and then sometimes feel like white Catholics are still not listening. And so it's very consoling for me to hear from you um, everything you just said tonight. So thank you. It really means a lot. Thank you both so much. Uh, we're, I would like to go to Dr. Kim Harris. She has a question. Thank you. Thank you. Very good to see you. I'm so glad I've had a chance to, uh, to be here and to listen tonight. Um, my question is, is, is fairly short. I just want to ask, uh, I was very touched as you talked about your personal experience and how difficult it has been to receive the hate mail. And, mm -hmm. and so I, I want to know uh, two things, if you don't mind sharing. One would be what do you find is helpful to you for self-care mm -hmm. and what do you suggest for for other people for particularly uh people of color who need to really prioritize oh. self-care so we can keep on doing what we what we need to do and and for our allies also mm -hmm. so yeah thank you thank you so much uh dr harris i think some what I have found that that is the most helpful for me and that is the best um, self-care for me is to be in community with other black and brown Catholic women. I can't tell you the, the times in the past year where I really thought I can't do this anymore. I don't wanna write. I don't wanna write this book. I don't wanna stay in this church. I don't wanna stay in this community that is so obsessed with whiteness and is so unwilling to, to, to center our experience and our voices. And it's black and brown Catholic women who keep me here. And they're the ones who show me how to take care of myself, who show me how to pray when I can't pray, who show me where God is moving, even when I can't, even when I can't um, see where he's moving. Um, and so my self-care, both personally, spiritually, and professionally, always comes from other women in this church, other women of color who, who show me what it really means to be this church. These are the women who keep me here. 
And they have been, again, I would not be where I am without the, the help of so, so many women who have really kept me, kept me doing this work. And it's women, some of the women who I've mentioned, like Anthea Butler, Tia Noel Pratt, Shannon D. Williams, but it's also Catholic women, other Catholic women like Leslie Colvin, who I think is on this call, Melissa Cedillo, other people who have spoken to me before I even wrote a book, people who before why Catholics started caring, these are people who told me that I matter, that my experiences matter, that my faith matters, and they keep me here and they keep me sustained even when I can't be sustained. And so those are, that's how I self-care, do self-care these days. And the tips that I have for people, especially for people who are trying to be allies, for people who are trying to help us when we are feeling down, when we are really, really struggling, especially for white Catholics, is to just remember that there is nothing that you are feeling, and I'm talking specifically to very privileged white Catholics in our church, everything that we are feeling, everything that you are feeling in the pandemic, the stress, the anxiety, the fears, is nothing compared to black and brown mothers who fear for their children's lives every single day. There is nothing compared to the fear that a father or a parent face when their child steps out into the world or when my partner goes to work in Manhattan every two or three times a week. There's, it's fear, right? Because he's going on into the world where the NYPD is roaming. And what I like to remind white allies in particular is to every single day, even in your personal life, even when you're off Twitter, even when you're not organizing, remember to uplift us, remember to pray for us, remember to challenge your racist, really problematic uncles, aunts, mothers, etc. And challenge your priests, challenge bishops, because everything that I've described here, fighting for a better church, fighting to be more Christ-centered, fighting to create a world where we're fully liberated, it is on white people to do that work. And that's what I tell allies. It is on you to remember to figure out how to do this work and to continue to do this work because Father Brian Mastingale, I love, and I'm paraphrasing what, what he says here, but he says, if it were up to us, there would be no racism in this country. There would be no racism in this church. There would be no racism in the world. And so I just tell allies to every single day, challenge yourself to create a more inclusive church and a more inclusive space in your life and figure out what it means to do that work, right? Like, yes, there are always going to be speakers like me who, who can help you. But at the end of the day, it is on you to challenge yourself and to do that work. And we need you to do that work because we're suffering. We're suffering every single day. And so that is, those are just some of the, some of the suggestions I have for, for allies who really want to create a better church for us. Mm, thank you so, so much. And amen. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dr. Harris. Thank you. Thank you both. I'm just gonna take one more question because we're almost at uh, 8.30 already, which, uh, you know, Olga, we could just go on forever. <laughs> just so beautiful to listen to and so powerful. And uh, I would just like, uh, I'll take one more question from Irma Dillard. Would you uh, ask your question, Irma? Uh, first, Olga, thank you so much for speaking power and truth. Um, love your book and everything you're doing. Um, I am a religious sister, religion of the Sacred Heart, and so, and also obviously a black woman. Um, so everything you were speaking, I'm saying amen to and thank you for it all. One thing I want to ask you, because Brian Massey, y'all know him well. Anyway, so the people you named right on. The Obama, mm -hmm. whoever named her, yes, she was a really good friend, a personal friend of mine. Oh. What I want you to, you, you touched on white supremacy, you touched on a few things, but, and you touched on, you know, basically, I believe that white people are the ones that are going to end racism, as in Massey says that. Why do you think that it is such an issue for the church, anybody, people in the pews mainly, to really speak to white supremacy? Because the truth is a Tim Dolan, people like that are white supremacists. I don't care how you mm -hmm. cut it, dice and slice it, they are. And yet they continue to be leaders in our church. The people in the pews that I have to deal with all the time are confused mm -hmm. because now the church it has become the politicians almost, and the politicians become the moral, um, I, can't, I lost the word, sorry, but you know, the moral judge, judges of who we are. So how do you feel about that? And what do you think we need to do about that? Yeah, thank you so much, Irma, for sharing, um, for sharing your thoughts. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I think there are a lot of leaders in our church who are just point blank, 
white supremacists. And I know that a lot of people are going to hear the both of us say that, and they're going to be shocked and very sort of apprehensive about the term, because again, there's that discomfort. Um, there's that white discomfort in our church. But I think the reason people are so unwilling to call it what it actually is, is because Americans have not been trained to do that work. We have not been trained to think about history. We have not been trained to connect the dots from human enslavement all the way to the insurrection, the violence at the Capitol. We have not been trained to connect the dots from the violence against indigenous um, Americans when colonizers first arrived to the detention camps at the border. But all of these things are related. And the reason so many people don't know how to talk about that is because we're not taught to do that kind of critical analysis. It took me 31 years and writing a book to fully be able to say, hey, capitalism is evil. It's destroying us. White supremacy is destroying us. And it's because the American educational system in particular doesn't want to teach us these things, right? Because the worst thing that can happen for this country is for people of color to realize, hey, wait a minute, we have been exploited, we have been lied to, and we have been devastated because the system thrives on our failures. The system thrives on exploiting our communities. And we need to get better, not just as a country and educational system, but also as a church. Again, this is why I always go back to the bishops because, or not just the bishops, our faith leaders, we have to help people in our church connect those dots, not just about the our nation as a whole, but also about our church, right? Like, I didn't know that the church was involved in human, human enslavement if it wasn't for the work of Shannon D. Williams. Like these are the things, and I have gone to Catholic school since I arrived in this country from the age of four all the way to 21. And that history was never taught to me. I've had to completely do a comp a, an unlearning and deconstruction process because this country does not want us to understand that white supremacy is not just this long ago thing. White supremacy is in an inextricable part of every single of our of our daily lives and we need to get better as a church and country at connecting those thoughts to people because that's where the revolution is really going to happen right once people realize that we've been kept down then that's when we're all of these systemic changes are going to happen but i think that people in our church don't want to talk about that because in order to call out white supremacy in our church we're gonna to have to name a lot of people that people don't wanna name. I can't tell you the times that I, anytime I criticize Cardinal Dolan, someone inevitably says, well, wait a minute, he's really, really respected. And I'm like, respected by who? Uh -huh. Respected by people with, with power, people with money, people who want to keep a certain type of woman and Catholic woman and man out of the church. And so people are afraid. And again, Catholic media in particular has to get better at challenging all of these things, at naming these things, at calling white supremacy what it is, because I think that is how people are going to get more comfortable and realizing where it is. And I think that, that, that that's why so many people are hesitant to call our leaders white supremacists, because they, they don't understand what it actually is. They don't know how to do that. My sister is a wonderful educator who's way more brilliant than I am, and she's been helping me understand this concept of um, I might get it completely wrong. So if someone's much more eloquent than me, I apologize. But this whole concept of historical dialectical materialism and understanding all the different histories that have happened and how they have framed how we socialize with each other and how we understand, again, what it means to be American. And I think that our church needs to develop that lens. Americans need to develop that lens. And then we will really start to realize if we all did that work, then we'd realize, wait a minute, most of our faith leaders are actually way worse than we actually think. But I think we don't have that lens as Americans. And so it's very easy for people to ignore the white supremacy right in front of them in the virtual pulpit or in the pews, you know? Thank you, because um, one more thing is that- Of course. When I said mentioned um, Gregory, um, our black bishops are sold, sold out as well because the open mm -hmm. Y doesn't name the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. They didn't mm -hmm. invite Brian Massinger to the table. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is, it's very, very true. It's true. Thank you, Irma, for, 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 for sparking that. And I can, I can talk about this more. So we, I definitely would love to connect with you to talk about this more if you're able, for sure. Yes, thank you. Wow, thank you all so much. I think Shannon said something that I remember. She said it's, it's Shannon D. Williams that you refer to. She's uh, guiding us on our Women Witnesses for Racial Justice Project. And she said, it's not the violence, it's the way we cover it up. 
we mm -hmm. and and I think that's exactly what you're talking about Olga one of the things I just wanted to alert you all to is uh, in this series, but also in our further work with the, the our anti-racism work, it's gonna go on for years because it's so necessary. And one of the things that I am very interested in finding out about, so I'm gonna name it here. So if anybody on this call can help me, um, I, want to, I want to have Kara or somebody do a study on how many prominent predominantly black Catholic churches have been shuttered or merged because that's also a kind of racist <laughs> act, I think, ab among our, our white bishops. And so I wanna, I, I think we need those statistics and no one has, to my knowledge yet, has actually um, done that work. So that's something that we're hoping to undertake so that we can put the, the story out there in terms of statistics and then look at policy and, you know, really, I think, uh, call puts more criteria in place uh, when it comes to the way uh, our white bishops have decided to close churches. So thank you, Olga. Oh my God, thank you so, so, so much. Uh, and all of you who uh, shared and talked and asked questions and offered beautiful commentary, we're just so grateful. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Russ. He's going to end it with uh, some of his wonderful music. And um, I don't know if he's going to do an announcement or two. But anyway, Russ. Thank you, Deb. Um, so just a heads up, we'll follow up. Um, tomorrow or at the latest the next day with um, a, a link to this recording as well as some other information, some other opportunities and some links to other things. Um, since she's on the uh, uh, call, I will say that um, my remarks beginning today um, on Mary Magdalene were directly inspired by Dr. Kim Harris. Um, so I'll make sure that I get a link uh, to you for her uh, preaching. Um, as well uh, when I include all these links. So again, thank you. I feel like I've just been to church, a uh, church that I needed um, for a long time. So thank you. Uh, please join me in singing uh, We Shall Overcome. She was invoked a number of times tonight and, and Olga's um, confronting and, and, and naming the USCCB. Uh, I feel like this, the spirit of Sister Thea Bowman is definitely with us tonight. So she, uh, she famously led the USCCB in a singing of We Shall Overcome. So please join me in singing that. I'm going to get out of here. We shall overcome. Shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. Deep in my heart, I do believe we shall. Shall all be 